Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, can you all hear me at the back? Yeah? OK. Because I like to speak with my hands and would prefer not to hold a handheld mic. Um, so my name is Zoya, and I work in the arts. Um, Please don't ask me what I do because I really do everything. I have um, worked in programming, I've done content, research, writing. I've been a bouncer, um, I've carried chairs around. So really when you work in the arts, you really get to work across every sort of aspect of creating and building. Um, today the theme that Amishi gave me is acceptance. And it's a really big, heavy theme, right? What does acceptance mean? Um, the best, I guess you can say, um, definition I've heard of acceptance is peace. Because where, to accept means that you stop fighting, you stop resisting, and you sort of reach a balance, right, in a way, a peaceful balance. Um, I don't have much time, so I'm going to jump right in, because as you can imagine, it's quite a big topic to cover. Um, this work that is on the wall, um, so I'm going to talk about three exhibitions or three projects that I've worked on, one being the Serendipity Arts Festival. Um, I was part of the curatorial team um, for an exhibition called The Sacred Everyday, the, um, embracing, the risk of di embracing the Difference of Risk, sorry. <laughs> but anyway, um, and it was a really fantastic exhibition. It was uh, across two venues. And what the exhibition really looked at is worship as a form of everyday, right? We all see um, little mandirs on sides of trees, um, on walls. And when worship is, is, is a part of everyone, we all sort of hold reverence in some way. Um, the second project that I'm going to talk about is START, what Amishi mentioned. Um, I was part of the programming team. And the third thing, of course, that I'm going to talk about is Kamathipura. Um, the work that we see on the wall is, of course, Hanuman. We're no stranger to him, right? Everybody knows Hanuman. He is the god of strength. He's also quite a forgetful god because he forgets his strength. Um, interestingly, um, so I got to write about him. And what I learned is that, interestingly, in Indic culture, so in India, Hanuman is um, he's celibate. He's very pious. You know, he's very relaxed and strong and sort of the strong silent type but in indonesia and thailand where they also believe in the ramayana hanuman um, is carnal he's playful right he's naughty which is quite a difference i would think between the in the hanuman we know him to be in india and the hanuman that we know him to be anywhere else um he's a very very popular god right uh, uh, so, the story of the Ramayana, I don't know if many of you know, but it traveled to, um, it traveled to Thailand and it traveled to Indonesia with trade, right? Trade, when you exchange, it's exchange of goods, it's exchange of cultures, and he sort of like flew across the seas to, um, uh, excuse me, so he flew across the streets to Indonesia, to Thailand, and I really love the fact that within Thailand, in, in, in Indonesia, in Thailand, they sort of accepted him as one of their own. Um, there is a Sri Lanka in Bali. Um, this, what you're seeing here, is a leather puppet. So in Indonesia, they also have a tradition of leather puppets. They're not as big as the ones you find in Andhra Pradesh, right? This is pretty much life size. But um, they're quite small. And interestingly, they're also performed by Muslim puppeteers. So I guess why am I talking to you about Hanuman? Why am I talking to you about leather puppets? Because there's a truth that they believe. And there's a truth in the story that we believe. And I guess the question really is, is whose story is it? And where does it belong? Um, as we were building the exhibition, right, you always prepare an exhibition for your first audience. And often when you're exhibition building, you think, hey, the first audience is um, the people that come for the preview, right? So it's usually like your friends or your friends and your benefactors, your sponsors. But at Serendipity, we realized um, that our first audience was actually the janitorial staff. They were the security and they were the packers and movers. Right? They started engaging with the work long before we had anybody from the outside really come in. 
Um, so we were told that they would refer to our exhibition as the Mandir because they were really gods from the entire spectrum. We had old gods, we had um, contemporary ideas of worship, so we had contemporary artists also respond to the idea of religion. And it was really great. And these ladies were really a force. It was amazing. They would walk through this space with their mops in hand and like really dangerously like swinging it from side to side. And I remember we'd look at them and think, oh God, they're going to bump into a painting. We're going to come out with a dent. We have to call this person, tell them that, you know, insurance has to pay out. But of course, thankfully, that did not happen. And um, it was really wonderful. Like there would be the lady in the middle there. She was the manager. So she'd have a phone in one hand, the mop in the other, and be screaming instructions. Ah, da, 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 and then like instructions would come back. And it was just so much fun to watch. Now, one of the instances that prompted us to realize this was when um, the lady at the back, I don't think you can see her, um, she stopped one day to look at this painting. Okay, and this is a painting of Gandhi um, breaking open a temple door to allow this mum and young child to enter the temple, right? Because, of course, we know that spaces of worship within our country also, they come with certain boundaries. Um, not everybody can access the temple. We know about these things. So, and I remember seeing her. She just stood there in front of the, in front of the painting. Again, mop in hand. But she stood there for five minutes. And, and she was just absorbing it. Now, if you've been a part of an exhibition install, you know it's loud, it's noisy. Um, everybody's like running everywhere, last minute, um, you know, things to be done. But I, re I just remember looking at her and I remember thinking that it was just peace. Like when I see her, all I see is just somebody peacefully looking at something that she could possibly achieve. Well, this is what I think she was thinking anyway. I could be wrong. Um, another reason, Another thought, reason, or like another, I guess you can say anecdote as to why we thought that we should. Um, it was our staff that was really our first audience is this wall. Okay, now this wall has a lot of calendar art, right? We see these images everywhere. Um, and after the packers and movers had done their job, they used to be like walking around the space, you know, sort of looking at the artwork. Packers and movers have access to some of the best art, <laughs> right? Um, and they looked at the wall, and I remember three of them, they're contemplating it, they're looking at it, and they're like, Thoda zyada nahi ho gaya. <laughs> I remember Ranjit walking in, and I was like, hey, did you hear the critique of your wall? And he was like, yeah, that was pretty good, wasn't it? Um, Ranjit Hoskode was the curator of the exhibition. Um, and it was really wonderful to sort of see that interaction and that experience with them. Um, another piece that um, the staff as well as the audiences really um, engaged with was this work by Smriti Dixit. Um, a lot of people didn't know what it was, but they would come and they would just stand there and they would look. And I would walk up to them and say, hey, do you know what the work's about? And of course, we'd have like really wonderful answers. Somebody said that it looks like a butcher shop. Um, right, because religion and cow and things like that. But this work is about menstruation. And it's also about um, the fact that when, right, when a woman has her period, she's shedding the lining of her uterus. And that means that she can give life. But when a woman also has her period, she's considered impure. So sort of really like a tug and pull, right, between the purity and the impurity. And that's the work. And I think it was this family here that's taking the picture. Uh, I went up to them and I said, hi, do you like the work? Do you know what it's about? And I explained it to them. And they promptly turned around. They gave me their phone and were like, can you please take a picture of us? <laughs> so it was really, really quite fantastic to see people engage in such a meaningful way. And obviously, everybody had their own story to tell, their own sort of relationship that they were forming within, with the work. Um, the exhibition was in two parts, one being at the convent of Santa Monica. It is a really beautiful convent um, in Old Goa. It was very quiet. It was very peaceful. Now, this collaboration was with the Museum of Christian Art. 
Um, so the museum is actually at the back. Um, you see the arch at the back. So it was under renovation at the time. So we were very lucky that we got to show the work in the actual church space. So behind me is the altar. And of course, the mandate that we were given is that the only work that we can show is Christian work, right, of course. Um, but we were an exhibition that was talking about syncretism through visual art. So what we did is we showcased various works by various people. So there was, let's say, for example, the Virgin Mary wearing a sari. Um, right? Um, there were arms boxes. Um, and it was really, really quite interesting. We had a few pieces from the collection of the museum itself. Um, the works that I want to talk to you about are the Isa Nama, which um, is part of the Sarmaya Arts Foundation's, Arts Foundation's collection. Um, this is a the first miracle at Kana. Okay, um, uh, we're all familiar with the, the time when Jesus turned water into wine. And um, normally when we think of biblical art, we think of really old European art, right? You think of um, Greco-Roman architecture, um, you think of white Caucasian faces. But what Paul Abraham did in collaboration with Manish Soni, so this work is actually uh, a commission piece and there are going to be 36 of these such paintings, is that he reimagined what it would be like. Um, Kana is in Lebanon. So what Manish and Paul did is that they actually discussed the work and they discussed, okay, fine, if this had to be, let's say, in Kana, if it had to be maybe historically accurate. So they looked at what the architecture would be like, what type of, um, what instruments would be there, what the urns would look like, the urns in which Jesus was pouring wine into, right? Um, again, the Last Supper, we always think of Leonardo as like painting and it's really nice and long, but this is possibly what the Last Supper was. And what I find very interesting about this work is that it sort of lies between this potential of the possibility of what was and what could be. Because let's say had Christianity moved west, eastwards, sorry, instead of westwards, this is how we would be documenting it. So it's really interesting that it lies in that very a space that we don't often consider, right? Now, talking about non-white cube spaces, I'm going to move on to Sassoon Docks. Um, how many of you all went or visited the, the show, right? Oh, quite a few, yeah. It was really crazy. Um, so I'm going to talk to you all a bit about the programming and, of course, a bit about the visual arts and sort of how I interacted with it and what I saw. Um, now, the building that I want to talk about is the first building that opened because that's also the building that I spent the most time in. That was my programming building. Um, what I really enjoyed about it is that almost every artwork or sort of every step, every 10 steps that you took while walking through the space, the artists were responding to the docks in a, in a very literal way. So if you look at this wall, which is filled with contemporary Varley painting, Varley painting has nothing to do with the Kohli people, it has nothing to do with fisher folk, but the ships, right, that you see along there, um, the artists actually painted the names of ships that were actually docked in Sassoon. So while they were painting it, when the fishermen would be walking past, they'd be like, oh, that's our boat, oh, that's our boat. And I think it was a sort of scene where they were seen. Um, a lot of the fish were also fish that you would find in the docks. Of course, fish that fit within the language of um, Varli art itself. But they did respond to them. They drew from the space. Um, as you walked in further, of course, there was the work of Parak Tandil, who is a Kohli man himself, and he had these resin objects that um, represented uh, the microorganisms. We, if you go a bit further, there was Guido Van Hilton, who had these three Kohli women that were on the wall. Um, the paintings were remaining from the 2017 edition. Um, so I wasn't a part of the festival then, but I was told that when these women whose portraits are painted on the wall, they came to this space, they like started crying. They were so overwhelmed and so touched by that gesture. Um, if you go up, uh, there was Samir's work, um, Samir Kulavur and Sandeep Meher, 
its work. Um, and again, they're sort of questioning, how did Bombay come to be built? We sort of built off right the backs of the Kohli's. Um, the Trespassers, again, um, very, very interesting collective. They never approach a, a wall with a plan. What they do is they go to a space, they look around, they observe, and then they paint what they see. And of course, last, um, at the roof, I don't know how many of you all did manage to make it through the roof, through the really hot, terrible crowds, but at the roof were sound pieces, it was a sound piece, sorry. And um, Pranav, Go Pranav Gohil, he explained to me, he said, you know, Zoya, um, we're all at the docks, and everything here in this space is angled towards the sea, but we never hear the sea. That's the one thing we don't hear. So what he did is he documented Sassoon docks at different times of day, and he put that into this like rather large um, water container. Um, but he also did say that maybe you can hear the sea at night when there's nobody else around. So it was really interesting how, whether they had planned or not planned, there was just this response. And then of course, with the programming, we made sure that the docs did come in. We definitely encouraged people from, um, you know, the local people, the people that work there to come in and see the work themselves. Um, the Mumbai Urban Art Festival and Start India is not a formal um, institution in a way, right? There's really a lot of room um, to do whatever you want. And content-wise, we could just really like have the best of it. So we could, of course, ha we had um, kids groups come in. I love it. He's just lying down and looking at the, at the work. And that was okay. Um, we had um, Gezi come in and they had a showcase. And again, it was about identity in the city. Um, we had Talio Ki Toli. Um, oh, yeah. And people were dancing in the space. It was amazing. Like, and I mean, we read about what happens to queer people in the papers and sort of just a general space. But this, this showcase, the crowd was incredible. Like they were clapping, they were dancing, and it was just so encouraging to see. We, of course, could have different types of um, sports. I guess you can say more contemporary, so slacklining, malcolm, ancient sports. Um, we had an electronic set by Reproduce, which was um, artists came and they responded to the different rooms, I guess, which brought out a different type of engagement. We had, um, is that working? Oh, okay. Um, I don't think it's working. Anyway, it's fine. Um, we had a Kathak performance as well that wove through the space, which was really quite wonderful as well. Oh, oh, mm, sorry. Mm, let's see if we can see a bit of that. Um, but yeah, okay, now um, I cannot talk, I cannot be standing here in this gallery surrounded by Samir Kulavur's work and not talk about him, right? Um, this was possibly one of the most popular pieces that we had at the exhibition. Um, and I know this for a fact because there were times when I had to cordon off the work. Should we have it if we were having events and people say, but we've come from so far and like, please, you have to let us see it. And they would be negotiating with me. And I'd be like, no, from health and safety perspective, I'm sorry, I have to close this off. So it was very, very popular. Um, as you can see, this is what the team looked like putting it together. They were, I think, parked in. They were parked in um, the mezzanine floor, which is what we called it, for over a week, working to make something. Um, I hope that you guys had a chance to go see it. If you did not, it is in um, the room where the toilet is, so please go take a look. Um, I mean, it was, it was so great that people would love to touch it. I know that there was somebody who wanted to open one of the windows to see if there was something inside because they were so in awe of the, the kind of work that he put into it, they put into it. Um, somebody wanted to pluck one of the AC vents 
of a bed and take it home. And then, of course, the team had to very politely say, no, <laughs> this is for display only. Um, now, our audiences, the human audiences, weren't the only ones that loved <laughs> the work. Yes, those are cats. <laughs> so there would be mornings when we would come back, um, come to find the cats have crawled into the sculptures and have spent the night there. Okay, here you can see the little cat eye. And I think, thankfully, because I didn't have to worry about that, I, I had the luxury of chuckling. Every morning I'd be like, ha, 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 there's a cat in, <laughs> in the sculpture. Um, of course, my colleague who did have the joyous job of telling Samira or Sandeep, like, she'd come, she's like, oh no, I have to tell them, they've said that this is the last time they're going to fix it, I don't know what to do. Um, and I understand, right, because that's a lot of hard work. <laughs> I mean, a piece like that has taken them, obviously, months of planning and weeks of building. Um, now, but there's nothing you can do. Of course, there were grand plans of having the space barricaded, but we also realized that cats are very crafty. And if they want something, they're going to go get it. It doesn't matter if you say no, they don't care. Um, <laughs> so, um, finally, I think we just sort of reached an understanding that, you know, the cats, they are what they are. But I guess this entire incident begs us to question. The cats lived there long before the exhibition came in. And they're going to continue living there long before the exhibition moves out, right? So in a work that sort of talks about the colonization of space, um, it's really interesting how the cats seem to be recolonizing <laughs> their space, right? And um, for any of you who actually follow Samir on Instagram and have followed him for a while, you know he's a cat person. So I think this is even funnier that like the cats sort of like jumped into the space and they would like burrow in there. Oh, so great. But um, now speaking of unwanted beings in urban spaces, I'm going to come to, to the last part of my talk, Kamathipura. Um, this is a 19th century map of the space. Um, as you can see, it's not spelled the way we know it today. Um, of course, it's a very anglicized spelling. Um, the space actually looks exactly the same. Um, so within the map, the only difference is that now you have forest road cutting through the top corner of it. The tanks no longer exist. The dharamshala is very much there. Um, the Muslim burying ground that you see at the top, there is still a kabristan. So not much has changed. Um, when we think of Kamathipura, you think of one thing, right? And thanks to Gangubai, that's now been reinforced. The movie sort of reinforced that stereotype. Uh, I mean, everything they say about Kamathipura is true. Yes, it is a red light district, yes. Um, there are parts of it that are not safe. Yes, um, the mafia had a stronghold there, right? The Pathans did. For everybody who's not familiar with Karim Lala, Ajay Devgan at Gangu, in Gangubai, right? Like, so yes, there were very, very dangerous people that lived there. Um, what I do um, when I take people through walking tours of the space is that I talk about everything that is everything but, right? Red light districts don't exist in silos. They are, I mean, there is, there are, spaces around them, there are economies around them, there's, there's life around them. And I think that's very important to understand. Um, in no way do I disregard or ignore the bad parts of it, right? No way do I not talk, I, of course, on my walk I do talk about the red light district. On my walk I do talk about the gangs, but I also talk about more. Look, I understand the fear, a lot of people come and ask me before they come and walk, they're like, is it safe? And I'm like, yes, when you're with me, you will be safe. Um, when, before I started this walk, my parents, I think, were petrified. They didn't really say it, but I knew it. Um, I could not go unless I was chaperoned by my brother. Now I would like to say that my brother is safer with me. <laughs> um, 
And it's really wonderful um, to sort of interact with people. Um, and we spoke about like contradiction before, right? With Hanuman, we spoke about how he was inherently contradictory, like in, in the belief of him. And Kamathipura is a fantastic example of that because it's a congested area with um, so many marginalized communities. They understand acceptance sort of better than anyone. Um, I'll give you an example. When I used to walk through there before, I used to be very, very nervous. I would be like, okay, fine, you know what, I have to dress like very well, I have to be like modest, I have to do this, I have to do that. And I would just be so aware of myself in a way. But I think the more I started to accept myself and who I was and the position that I had within that space, the easier it got for me and for people around me to interact with me. Um, I think one of my favorites, favorite um, interactions happened recently where um, I was with a group and this happens fairly often where people will just stand and stare at me like really pointedly, you know, with like great concentration. And so this man did it. Um, I think he had, a, he had a bit of an eye thing. He was kind of doughty. So I mean, just like not really, but anyway, but he was fine. He was just like staring at me. We walked to the next point. And again, he, he stops and he's staring at me. And then suddenly, like, he breaks into a smile. He says, Madam, you don't talk about Hindi. You don't talk about Hindi. So how do we know what you're talking about? And he's like, no, 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 you talk about Hindi. Mein bolo, Hindi mein bolo. And of course, I was with a group at that time. So I didn't want to switch. And, um, and we met him again on the way. And I was like, you know what? I will come find you. And we'll do this. We'll chat about it. And I loved it. I loved the fact that he thought it was OK for him to come to me and like very out of like pure curiosity say, hey, I want to know what you're saying. And, and you're obviously saying something good. Like he trusted me to say that you're saying something great. So of course, I must ask you what you're talking about. Like you come with so many people every day, right? Um, which was really fantastic. Um, the doors, doors in Kamathipura are never closed. Everybody is always ready to receive. And that, I think, really says something about a space that's so stigmatized. Right? Um, the last image that I want to leave you with is of a temple, because it is as pure as pure can be in a very otherwise impure area. Um, the lady is sitting in the middle. You can't see her face. Um, she is Neelambai. She's the one who commissioned this um, piece of, sorry, the, the temple back in the early 19th century. Um, very interestingly, I, I learned that her granddaughter was a part of the freedom movement and she went to jail with Sarojini Naidu, which is really quite interesting because in a space again that you otherwise um, you know, think of as illiterate, um, with, without facilities, without amenities, there is an obvious sense of people to to walk around and they are engaging and they are fighting because they do understand things that more often than not you don't expect from a place like this. Um, at the beginning of this talk, I told you that um, acceptance means peace. And for me, I found my peace in Kamathipura. Um, thank you all. This has been really, really quite interesting and incredible, but I would like to have more time, I guess, for questions and for us to sort of engage. Um, before we do that, I would, of course, quickly like to thank um, Henna and Amishi for all of the work that they've put to making this morning happen and to all of you for waking up early on a Saturday morning.